I'm really excited to introduce today's event and today's speakers. Uh, I think that what we're going to hear today does so much of what I had hoped 19B would allow us all to do. That is, it's in Russian and in English. It brings together scholars from different continents, different traditions, speaking in English and in Russian. And we get to think about really exciting new theoretical work that will mean different things to all of us here. Um, so today's speakers are editors of an important and contributors to um, an important new volume, really important new volume on 19th century Russian realism. Came out recently from NLO. It's called Ruski Realism Dignatskiyaka Orchestra Znania Polistrolania. Russian Realism of the 19th Century Society, Knowledge, and Narrative. So I'm thrilled that we have all three editors here today. We have Margarita Weissman of St. Andrews University, Alexey Dovin, Higher School of Economics in Moscow, Ilya Kligar, my colleague at NYU, and Kirill Aspalvats of the University of Wisconsin. We're also very grateful for our discussions. Mikhail Markiev, who will be joining us any minute from Moscow State University, and Hildi Hugenbaum from Arizona State University. Um, so let's let's get started. Thank you all so much for being here. Great, thank you very much, Anne and, and, and Sasha, Sarah, and so many other people uh, for making this possible. I uh, I just have a very brief uh, introduction where I, I want to say uh, a welcome also to our contributors. Uh, who are uh, more than encouraged uh, to speak, uh, uh, to say their piece uh, about the, about the, uh, the volume and their own contributions, uh, and also to reiterate that we welcome uh, questions and comments in Russian, and in fact, some of our presentations are in Russian as well. So uh, I will- Ilya, can you just speak up a little bit? It's difficult to hear you. Uh -huh. Okay, is this better now? No. Um, uh, maybe a little bit louder. Uh, how about now? No. That's perfect. Just shout a little bit, maybe. Okay, I will shout. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sasha. Um, uh, yes. So, so uh, I will pass on the word to uh, uh, Alexey Dovin. Please, uh, Alexey, uh, begin. Start us out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lia and colleagues. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this uh, uh, book. Here it is. You can see it instead of our slides with uh, this daguerreotype from the middle of the 19th century. And now I uh, take the liberty uh, to switch into Russian for the sake of uh, diversity, so to say, and for the sake of time. Спасибо еще раз. Я э, с, по договоренности с коллегами начну нашу э, короткую презентацию. Мы постараемся кратко рассказать о нашем замечательном томе. Некоторые участники этой книжки здесь с нами сегодня. И я хотел вначале сказать пару слов о, о э, целевой аудитории нашей книги, для кого, собственно, мы ее э, издавали, и о том контексте, научном и историческом, в котором она появилась. Дело в том, что эта книжка стала результатом нашей совместной трансатлантической, я бы так сказал, работы с многими из присутствующих коллег и результатом серии конференций о реализме в Ейле, в Университете Нью-Йорка, в Москве, в 5-6 лет назад собралась очень интересная компания и сеть образовалась коллег, с которыми мы и решили сделать этот сборник. Но когда мы стали делать и обдумывать композицию сборника, да, теоретическое концептуальное введение, стало понятно, ну, в первую очередь, участникам, имеющим русский бэкграунд да, и живущим в России, как, например, я, да, стало понятно, что э, мы должны как-то отрефлексировать э, ту ситуацию, которая в России и в российской науке э, сложилась с э, реализмом, а в кавычках. Очень часто в России до сих пор это можно встретить, и вот меня, например, э, много лет так учили, и с коллегами мы это обсуждали. Реализм 
в каком-то смысле сейчас последние 20-30 лет как такой стиль, как эпистема знания в России во многом девальвировано. Это связано с ну, сложными историческими, всем известными обстоятельствами. Да, в советское время сложно, то есть обязательно нужно было что-то писать о реализме, и это набило оскомину, это вызывало, вызывало и у многих продолжает вызывать такую аллергическую, стойкую аллергическую реакцию, и многие просто стремились уйти от этого. Но чем дальше мы работаем и преподаем реализм студентам в России, да, тем становится очевиднее, что это не совсем естественный путь развития науки, изучения реализма. И в этом сборнике мы попытались восполнить этот пробел и ввести реализм, в том числе русский реализм, для русского читателя в широкий международный научный контекст и показать русскому читателю, поскольку эта книга все-таки адресована русскому читателю, в первую очередь русскому ученому, студенту, коллегам русским, да, российским. Очень важно нам было показать, как можно изучать реализм сегодня, какими инструментами можно пользоваться, в каких контекстах его можно исследовать. И наш сборник открывается небольшой такой водной частью, в которой мы попытались представить ландшафт позднесоветских исследований реализма. Ну, вроде бы мы все это знали, да, еще с университетских, с университетских курсов по истории литературы, да, вот как изучали реализм в 70-е, 80-е, начале 90-х годов в Советском Союзе и России, но интересно было вернуться в, виртуально вернуться в это время и посмотреть, что писали о реализме такие исследователи, как Лидия Яковлевна Гинзбург, Игорь Павлович Смирнов, Владимир Маркович Маркович, Юрий Михайлович Лотман, Григорий Михайлович Фридлендер. Вот эти фигуры у нас возникают в, в, в введении, и мы пытаемся вписать их идеи о том, что такое реализм, да, как его можно препарировать, как его можно анализировать. В, с одной стороны, в контекст э, европейской и американской э, науки того же времени, да, синхронно с ними. С другой стороны, посмотреть, что мы можем сегодня взять с собой из того наследия, а что уже, к сожалению, не можем. Ну и если коротко, то я уже, так сказать, сейчас готовлюсь передать слово следующему спикеру. Если коротко, то э, вот когда мы взглянули на это позднесоветское наследие, особенно на наследие Гинзбург, э, на наследие э, Марковича и Лотмана, то мы, конечно же, увидели очень интересные параллели и пересечения с э, э, американскими и европейскими исследователями реализма, и об этом мы постарались сказать. Ну вот, на этом я думаю, что я передам слово следующему спикеру. Это, если я не путаю, Илья. Спасибо. Да, это я. Uh, спасибо, Алексей. Thank you, uh, Алексей. I um, uh, very briefly would like to... Um, continue in, uh, in, in, in some ways in, in, in the same vein uh, by uh, talking about um, one of the kind of motivations behind uh, our put, having put together this. Am I screaming loudly enough? Yeah. One of the motivations for our putting uh, this volume together was to be, begin or, or actually rather to continue because a lot of the people who are present here and some who are not present here have already started doing this work to be to continue then grappling with the fact that during the last 50 or 60 years western scholarship on realism has developed a very rich and, and broad set of approaches to understanding the socio-historical dimensions of literary works so in fact unsurprisingly it was realism precisely realism that was the most generous soil for the development of such theories when you might think of Georg Lukacs Raymond Williams Frederick Jameson 
Nancy Armstrong, uh, Catherine Gallagher, and so on, the list, uh, of course, can go on. Meanwhile, as Alexei has pointed out, the corresponding field of inquiry in Slavic studies has tended to be limited both by the constraints of the official line and on the, during the Soviet times and on the other side of the spectrum, sometimes the political spectrum, um, uh, by attempts to steer clear of sociological analysis altogether as, as, as much as possible. So very briefly, if one looks at what has been done by Western socially minded understandings of uh, realist fiction, um, several things come to mind that, are, that, that, that seem particularly significant. For the first, uh, uh, to begin with, um, uh, an attempt to rethink within the Western Marxist paradigm the base superstructure dualism without giving up the need to think uh, about the two uh, together. So the emergence of categories and concepts like the whole social process, which is, of course, Raymond Williams, or the social formation, which is, uh, uh, um, you know, inspired by Althusser, um, and their application to the uh, reading of uh, literary works and whole traditions by um, uh, Frederick Jameson, Raymond Williams, among others. Um, second, and I will mention these things very briefly, we can return to them in discussion if there is um, uh, any, any desire to do so. Uh, the related movement away from the model of reflection and towards the model of production. So literary texts, we need to appreciate the fact that literary fiction, especially realist fiction, takes an active part in legitimating and installing values, norms, conceptions of subjectivity, structures of perception that are congenial with what might loosely be understood as a certain class project or class projects. In other words, it's not a matter of just reflecting what is out there, but the matter of installing a notion of reality uh, uh, actively. Um, three, debates, uh, very, um, very active debates about the historicity of literary form. What is literary form's specific relationship to history? Right? Jameson uh, famously uh, uh, told us to always historicize. It's not entirely clear what uh, that means, right? Uh, generally, we have a move away from a kind of stagism and strict historicism that would characterize previous uh, um, attitudes to literary form towards an appreciation of its non-synchronicity or the stratification of forms and genres in the context of uh, especially combined and uneven development. And this then takes me to the next uh, point that I want to make, namely the movement, uh, still more recent in some ways, towards the project of worlding realism or attempting to understand how realism work, works outside the global center in peripheral and semi-peripheral national uh, contexts. Uh, and examples of this are very interesting examples of this are two works that are two uh, projects that I can think of, the Warwick Collectives uh, project on uh, combined and uneven development, which contains a, an interesting chapter on Pilevin, and uh, the recent issue of uh, the novel Forum on Fiction, uh, the journal, the novel uh, from 2007, uh, called something like Worlding Realism Now. And finally, uh, I would like to mention current debates um, uh, on symptomatic reading and hermeneutics of suspicion. Uh, what is real, in other words, what is real, what is this real in realism? Is it the minutiae of everyday life, the subtleties of feeling, the complexities of relationship, or is it something underneath all this, a deep-seated ideological structures? Is realism aware of what it is being real about? So in this context, um, uh, in the context of these developments and some others, which I haven't had time to mention, um, we are afforded a set of interesting opportunities. Uh, first, we can uh, test Western uh, paradigms against Russian case studies in the hope of shedding further light on the Russian tradition. How do approaches to French and Victorian realism fit the Russian counterparts? What becomes illuminated in the course of such a confrontation about the unity of the European literary field as well as the diversity within it? another opportunity to expose the limits 
conversely, to expose the limits and blind spots, uh, but also the surprising insights of these theoretical approaches when confronting, so to speak, foreign material. Specifically, what does one do with the category, and this is a common issue, right? What does one do with the categories of the bourgeoisie and the middle class symbiotically linked to realism by Western theoretical approaches? Um, three, again, conversely, to re-encounter the Russian and Slavic theoretical tradition, and this I'm echoing Alexei here once again, to re-encounter elements of that tradition, also interested in developing an understanding of the social historicity of form, um, uh, in, and place them in conversation with congenial developments in Western scholarship. So I can think of uh, maybe unusual suspects like the formalists, right, who, uh, uh, some of whom claimed to be better Marxists than Marxists, right, the, the, the tradition of historical poetics uh, and the various sort of sociological, uh, already Soviet, early Soviet, um, uh, developments of that uh, in someone like Viktor Zhermunsky, cultural semiotics, obviously, uh, figures within the so-called Bakhtin circle, like Valentin Voloshinov, who was in fact himself, whose Marxism and philosophy of language was extremely influential for some of the projects that the, that the Western literary theory has, has undertaken, um, as well as Pavel Medvedev, Bakhtin himself, and the vulgar sociologist uh, Valerian Periversev just to mention a few. And finally, then to start working towards theoretical models that would take into account both of these traditions while focusing on the Russian material and with broader explanatory ambitions in, uh, to ask the question, in other words, what can the Russian material tell us about the social historicity of literary form more broadly, tell us something that other material uh, uh, doesn't tell us as vividly. Um, Okay, and here I will stop and pass the baton over to Margarita Weisman. Uh, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilya. Thank you. That's actually a great segue into what I was um, going to say. Um, just briefly to introduce myself, because I realize that I don't know absolutely everyone, although some of you I know really well. Uh, my name is Margarita Weisman, and I'm lecturer and head of the Russian department at the University of St Andrews in Scotland. Um, and similarly to Alexei, I have this kind of double vision, um, having done um, a kandidatska in Russia and then um, a PhD in the UK. Um, and what I thought I'd do in the time that I have is to help contextualize our book um, in the huge sea of similar editions about other literary traditions um, and also talk a little bit about the philosophy and ethos that all of us as editors brought uh, to it. So if I could ask Sasha to put on one of the slides that I've prepared. It's just three slides, don't worry. I won't talk for more than five minutes. Um, but I thought it's a very good graphic illustration of the kind of things that I'm talking about. So if Sasha could just put oh. that on. Okay, let me go ahead and do this. Thank you. And one second, I want to make sure yes. that I can keep monitoring uh, the meeting while I'm doing this. So, oh, I see. Okay, so please go ahead. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I should say that um, I am very grateful to be a part of that project. I'm very happy about that because I have joined Alexei, um, Ilya and Kirill once they've already started the project. And one of the reasons why I wanted to be a part of the editorial team behind this book is precisely because of the things you can see here on the slide. So what I have collated there are books that have been published in the last, my mathematics are not great, so decade, two decades. Um, that are devoted to various realisms. And you can see here, typical for um, Anglo-American humanities, you have the realism one, which of course obviously is the realism in English, uh, German realism companion, American realism and naturalism, magical realism and American literary realism as different editions. So this is kind of what has been going on in the world of the kind of editions that our book joins. So on the one hand, it presents or tries to present cutting edge scholarship in terms of approaching a very canonical text, but at the same time it offers an entry point introduction to people who are interested in the subject and have a slightly specialist background, be it either advanced undergraduate students or graduate students, or um, a very good teaching aid as well for the subject of realism. And if we can go to the next slide, please.
So this next slide presents books that most of you, no, sorry, if we can just go back. <laughs> Great, thank you. That one presents books that most of you know and love or maybe hate, and I bet lots of you using your teaching as well, roughly from around the same time frame. And you can see the kind of difference we have there in the subjects that they cover, right? So we have the general introduction to Russian literature, one of my favorite books ever, the introduction to Russian poetry, modern Russian culture, 20th century Russian literature companion. Um, and you can notice that in these kind of books that are dedicated for the broad audience, the approach is quite often based on time period. And also the 19th century is not greatly represented, aside from, again, one of my second favorite books, the classic Russian, the companion to the classic Russian novel. So the kind of thing that Alexei was talking about when he mentioned that the Russian realism has kind of fallen off the agenda of contemporary scholarly discussions in Russia is actually something that is very obvious when you look at the kind of publications in English I aimed at the general audience that have been produced in the last two decades. It has also affected the, the way in which Russian realism is represented in English in the uh, accessible editions, which is kind of where our book steps in. And just like Alexei says, it is aimed at an, aud to, at an audience that reads in Russian, but it very specifically brings in um, texts written by people in English, Russian and German who work on these um, on these topics all over the world. Um, and I think it actually fills in the gap, not just in the Russian scholarship, but in the field of Russian studies um, in both English and Russian. And if we can go to the third slide, please. Yeah, so there I've just summarized um, the um, kind of thematic blocks that we have in the bit of our book that we hope would be specifically the most useful bit for the so-called general audience with um, with specialist interests, right? So we have, um, and it kind of maps roughly on what Ilya was talking about as well. So in the introduction, we've tried to cover uh, such um, topics as phantom realism, исследование реализма в позднем СССР, социальное воображение, воображаемое, экономик реализма, реализм и научной эпистемологии XIX века и месяца саморефлексии в русском реализме. This reflects, on the one hand, obviously the specialisms of all the editors involved, and on the other hand, also what we think are the most important nodes of theoretical exploration of in contemporary study of realism and of course we can talk about all of those things in greater detail when we get to discussion and just to wrap up um what i think is very important as well is we have a special section in the book that talks about the kind of perspective and future vectors of development of the discussion of realism and these i think would also be kind of very good points for discussion um today and of course the main thing there is the um adding new texts to the canon, because as much as we tried, we haven't actually managed to gather a lot of articles that talk about non-canonical writers, including um, women, for example. Um, and we didn't really have that many articles that talked about um, realism outside of the novel, which is something um, that's uh, quite interesting in itself as well. So this hopefully gives an idea of um, the kind of place that our book occupies in the general context of similar editions uh, on realisms um, in uh, the Anglo-American um, humanities. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, uh, Margarita, and I think I'm the next and I'm the last of the editors and I'm going to uh, use the the time that that I have to to uh, talk a bit about the uh, some of the specifics of the methodological uh, publications that 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 uh, uh, that we have attempted here and uh, it all of course as Alexei has stated it all of course sounds much more provocative in, in Russian and in the context of Russian academia than it does in English but it was uh, 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 even though there is uh, there is already a work being done it felt really productive right to uh, bring in together the major concepts that uh, uh, allow us to view realism as a way of uh, uh, constructing social reality, a particular kind of social reality, right? And the, 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 an overarching con uh, concept introduced uh, uh, 
uh, mentioned in our introduction is, is that of the social imaginary and the more, uh, not a more specific, but an adjacent one uh, uh, and a more pro definitely more provocative one is the concept of economy, right? We, one of the things that we did in this volume is that we kind of tried to reestablish uh, the uh, links of Russian realism with economy. Now, this is a paradoxical attempt because given the uh, Soviet legacy of Soviet Marxism, economy seems to be kind of the ubiquitous uh, key to, uh, to realism, right? You're supposed to open any Soviet era study of Russian realism and find economic uh, uh, analysis, but that's not the fact. That's not the case, right? After the uh, destruction of vulgarna uh, socialism uh, in the late 1930s, the economic studies of realism were not actually, uh, or of anything else, were not actually, did not actually occupy central place in, in Soviet official, official Soviet uh, studies uh, of, of literature. So this is uh, paradoxically, this emerges as a major uh, lacuna, right? A major gap uh, in studies that uh, that we have here, and it was kind of uh, interesting to think about this this uh, paradox that, of course, our volume alone cannot uh, cannot solve. And of course, the the position of of Lukács, who is uh, a, a major uh, Marxist theorist, uh, relevant for uh, the Western field, but also somebody who actually operated in the Soviet Union and published in the Soviet Union, right, is uh, I think very symbolic of the. Uh, both of intertwinement of uh, uh, the intellectual traditions, but also of how things, uh, of, uh, of the directions things did not take, uh, of things that did not happen, uh, especially as in, 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 in Soviet, Soviet Marxism. So uh, 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 it was interesting to think about uh, 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 the economy, not only the economic theory, but the economy as a, uh, uh, a key to a lot of things that happen in, in realism and are being shown by realism in three, uh, in several different different aspects, right? And of course, uh, the first major uh, 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 claim that has to be uh, kind of has to be made here is that the economy is not only something that uh, describes the the financial. Uh, uh, the financial uh, operations, right? It's not only a technical field, it's actually a way of looking at the whole totality of social existence, right? The economy is everything that is happening to us, right? And it's something that subsumes uh, the society and the state, right? And uh, this uh, economization of our view of the society's view of what is happening to it is something that was a major uh, uh, effect of realist writing, right? Realist writing shows the centrality of the horizontal operations of commercial economy, emerging commercial economy, to visions of society, of statehood, of morality, right? Where uh, the vertical state and the horizontal economy collapse together uh, in the, uh, Bilinski's introduction to uh, 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 Physiologia Peterburga, uh, the economy is both, uh, commercial economy is both a principle of interaction for the writer and, um, uh, uh, a, a principle of organizing the sovereign state by Peter the Great. And uh, 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 another way in which economy becomes a whole cultural paradigm, right, which underlies realist writing, but also dictates the way that realist writing shows uh, 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 or uh, the society and paints the society around it is the whole concept of, of modernity, right? We have the, uh, which is being constructed as modernity happens, right? Modernity basically uh, uh, so, uh, means that there is some kind of modern capitalist rational condition which comes to supersede the older one, right? And this is not only a matter of objective historiography uh, written by somebody who is outside of the process, but as, uh, as, as it's a matter of the society actually feeling itself undergoing this transition. And in that sense, of course, uh, the, re the real realism, Russian realist writing is a medium where this kind of Russia's modernity uh, 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 understands and proclaims itself. In that sense, the texts that we know as manifestos of the new commercial literature, such as Shvedov's Slavyasna Sitargovlia or many others are actually texts that demonstrate and that voice a new condition of the whole society, not just literature and not just the writer. 
in a situation where uh, um, there is a limited space for political analysis and the general condition. So literature becomes a medium where modernity, uh, Russian modernity and the advent of Russian modernity articulates itself. It's very hard to speak of the objective process outside of those, of those utterances. And of course, the, the last thing that I'm gonna mention is that the dialectic of modernity that described by Benjamin uh, in, in uh, works such as the storyteller devoted to Russian literature is that modernity implies something that is that came before. It implies a gaze towards uh, the past, towards remnants of the past that have to be constantly superseded, but also interacted with. It, uh, another way to put it is that modernity is constantly involved in imagining its own past. So this nostalgic sentimental gesture, sentimental in the Schillerian term, becomes another uh, crucial point of Russian realism. Not only does it uh, praise or describe or model progress, social progress, it also constantly models a gaze directed towards, towards the past, right? It constantly uh, invents it. And this is uh, the topic of, of Benjamin's storyteller, but this is obviously uh, and Benjamin writes it about uh, Benjamin writes about Leskov, but obviously this is, for example, the topic of uh, Oblomov as the major novel, where the whole concept of Oblomov, right, becomes central to the whole uh, project of the major Russian realist novel, and then uh, this feeds into the whole visions of Narodnost uh, 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 and the necessity to rediscover this. Uh, ancient authentic roots, which paradoxically becomes a centerpiece of Russian realist writing in works such as such as Nikasov. So this reinvention of authenticity that has to be destroyed by modernity becomes again one of the major tropes of modernity self-consciousness that are articulated through realist uh, writing of, of, of different kind. So those are some of the some of the issues that that uh, uh, we were thinking through and our contributors were thinking through with us uh, when we did this. And uh, uh, this really feels like this is a work which, which uh, uh, is only starting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirill uh, and everybody else. I, um, I think um, Mikhail is with us, uh, so I'm here. <laughs> Hi, hello. Um, so uh, maybe because I know you have time constraints potentially, so maybe we could uh, start with you. Я прошу прощения, тоже буду говорить по русски, да, мы среди славистов, славистов. Спасибо. Я постараюсь не быть тоже многословным, и я, может быть, разделю свои впечатления на примерно три. Три таких, три аспекта, и, и начну с самого простого, что, конечно, я, если относить, вот, как, если взять это просто как книгу, как сборник статей научных исследований, то это, ну, я же называется, могу только поздравить, это совершенно замечательный, совершенно замечательный сборник, поразительно, ни одной пустой статьи, чрезвычайно насыщенно. Я, я прочел от корки до корки, и, ну, то есть это понятно, может быть, даже это я лишнее говорю, но не, но не могу не выразить восхищение просто вот высоким научным уровнем. Это вот так уж у меня душ, из души, можно сказать, сорвется такая похвала. И, и правда, большое спасибо. Это действительно, вот я провел время в очень таком насыщенном интеллектуальной работе, читая эту книгу. Но это самое простое. Второе, второе вот важность этой, этой книги сейчас, да, и ее актуальность. И вот мне кажется, что издать такой, сделать такой сборник, сделать такое, и такое издание, конечно, мысль счастливая, мысль, конечно, очень важная, и я совершенно согласен с а, издателями, составителями, да, что, конечно, реализм, реализм, который так, ну, такой человека моего поколения вполне я 
могу пожаловаться на жизнь, навяз в зубах, да, который, которому принуждали, который считался вершиной. Да, у нас всегда выстраивалось там, классицизм, романтизм, реализм, а потом соцреализм, да, как вершина, значит, как такое поступательное движение. И, конечно, навязший в зубах, и я думаю, что и, и, и много, на самом деле, вот если задуматься, то реализм, этот сам термин, да, в нашей традиции довольно много, в общем, и вреда принес, да, принес, причем не только в смысле идеологизации советской науки, а такого вреда специфического, вот среди упомянутых вот во вступительной статье, очень содержательной, которая тоже, за которую я бы хотел поблагодарить, где очень хорошая представлена генеалогия да, этих исследований, очень такие содержательные обзоры. Но, скажем, но, но меня немножко удивило, скажем, отсутствие Гуковского, да, Григория, вот его реализм Гоголя, да, Пушкины, проблемы реалистического стиля. Я не хочу сказать, что ну, это очень большой ученый, да, который вот, провел очень много времени да, в таких схоластических вот, в общем -то, рассуждениях, да, и что такое реализм, чем он от, от нереализма отличается, как его определить. Вот, да, это, это вот, я не скажу, что Гуковский прямо так сказать, погиб из-за этого, да, но, но, но то, что вот это, вот это навязывавшееся да, такая... Так, такие требования, да, что вот если это хороший поэт, он реалист, да, что чтобы спасти поэта, надо сделать его реалистом, да, и, и отсюда вот такие схоластические очень упражнения, да, и, и очень, там, одно дело, когда Поспелов упражняется, да, в, там, в реализм, что там, реали... другое дело, когда Гуковский, да, это немножко, конечно, грустная такая, грустная картина, да, что Гуковский мог бы потратить, так сказать, на что-то более значительное. Да? Но, с другой стороны, еще раз, я, я считаю, что это правильно, что реализм, тем не менее, конечно, нельзя ни в коем случае списывать, да, ни в коем случае от этого термина, от, и от этого понятия да, отказываться нельзя. Мы, мы теряем слишком много, мы теряем... Ну, Огромное поле смыслов, огромное поле для исследований, и, и поэтому вот это намерение, да, реализм, снова вести в игру, так сказать, да, в, российс, в российское поле исследований я очень поддерживаю в высшей степени. И мне очень близок и, так сказать, общий такой теоретический подход, да, что авторы его вот вступительной статьи отказались вот от, эти, от этой схоластики, да, и программно отказались от того, что реализм, от того, вот, кто там реалист, кто не реалист, да, вот от этих споров, да, от каких-то таких избыточных определений, да, и это тоже хорошо. А увидели реализм как ну, некоторое поле, да, как эпистему, как вот поле, да, где э, рожда... которое существует взаимодействие с другими да, с полями, там, с другими, как раньше выражались, методами, да, и вот мне кажется, это подход очень продуктивный очень продуктивный, и он присутствует в, ну вот, в целом, в, этом, в духе этого сборника, так сказать. Мне, и мне это очень близко, кажется, очень хорошо и важно. Вот так, такой, такой взгляд на, на это явление и на эту проблематику. Третье, что бы я хотел затронуть, это ну вот, насколько как бы сказать, не то, что удачен, вот насколько, вот, вот чего мне не хватает в этом сборке, насколько э, вот э, э, авторы мне, мне и, и издатели, составители, ну, очень, тоже мне это очень нравится, с, сами говорят о том, чего там нет, да, о том, какие есть перспективы, да, и это тоже очень, конечно, хорошо, потому что, когда намечается как, какая-то перспектива, это отлично. И, но все-таки кое о чем я бы добавил, вот чего не хватает, я э, такой человек вредный, вот, э, но я, я, при этом я понимаю, да, что речь идет о сборнике, так сказать, коллек, это не коллективная монография, да, это, это составлен да, э, такой текст из работ самостоятельных серьезных ученых да, со своими круг, кругом интересов, да, со своими... Но я поэтому просто говорю о том, о результате, да, 
вот чего мне не хватает, какие лакуны, мне кажется. И, и лакуны, по-моему, все-таки мешающие делу. Вот первое, я думаю, что легко всякие читатели это видят, очень большая локализация по времени. Да? Если мы посмотрим, да, то есть вот тексты, да, и авторы, насколько я понимаю, первый это 45-й да, год, бедные люди. Да, но еще чуть-чуть ниже Белинский, да? начинается примерно с середины 40-х годов и заканчивается чуть раньше Чехова, вот Чехова, скажем, нету, да? То есть вот чего нет? Нет Пушкина, да? Нет Гоголя, нет вот, нет, нету вот этой, да, вот этого совершенно отсутствует вот этот период, да? до Достоевского, да, грубо говоря, до, до Тургенева. Вот, и при том, что сборник назван русский реализм да, 19 века. Вот. Еще раз, я понимаю, что это обусловлено да, другими обстоятельствами, что называется, да, просто полем интересов исследователей, которые в этом сборнике пили участие, но, но, но тем не менее это досадно. Вот, на мой взгляд, для результата, вот, вот, для общего понимания реализма да, и что, что, что это означает, да, Конечно, но, но, на мой взгляд, вот эта эпоха, 30-е да, годы, начало 40-х годов, ну, мне кажется, не, очень не помешало бы. Очень не помешало бы, в том числе еще раз, для каких-то ну, теоретических, установок теоретических проблем вполне. Да? Вот это, это первая лакуна, да, которая... Соответственно, Чехова я удивился отсутствие тоже. Но опять... То есть, конечно, вот обычно, да, вы убиваете реализм, да, говорит Горький Чехову, да, вот там слово Чехов, который убивает реализм, да, высшее выражение этого как бы реализма, да, его завершение, а вот тоже мне, может быть, немножко не хватило, да. Второе, тоже легко видеть, всякие, кто даже оглавление перестает, очевидный, даже не перекос, а просто Торжество прозы, да, торжество романной преимущественно прозы, и что мне очень обидно на самом деле, да, что совершенно отсутствует лирика, отсутствует лирическая поэзия. Еще раз, не как упрек, да, ясно, что так сложилось, да, но, но конечно, вот эта проблема лирика и реализм, да, реалистическая лирика, реалистическая поэзия, помимо того, что она обсуждалась, да, реализм, там, и лирики Пушкина, да, поэзия действительности там, да, вот, на, на мой взгляд, конечно, это, это лакуна очень досадная, да, и не хватает там не только очевидного Некрасова, скажем, да, или там поэтов Некрасовской школы, но, но, даже, но даже и Фета, например, да, как какого-нибудь, да, вот, вот и, и здесь, конечно, мне кажется, это досадно, да, потому что лирика вполне интересный объект, я, я думаю, что вот в, в, этом, в этом случае, да, мы помним лирика как парадигма современности, да, знаменитые, да, сборники, которые вполне лирику считают не, не чем-то периферийным, да, не каким-то явлением периферийным в эпохе, а, может быть, и центральным. Даже Фет, вот, в качестве просто примера, да, может быть, вы помните, что Фет, чествование Фета, да, его юбилей, его поэтической деятельности был инициирован русским психологическим обществом. Вот не, не поэтами, да, а психологами, которые обсуждали Фета как вот такого человека, который, такого поэта, который открывает какие-то там психические законы, которые пока не ясны современной психологии. Да, вот. И это, по-моему, было бы вполне в духе да, этой, этой сборники. Вот я, я такую статью о Фете, например, очень легко бы мыслил вот в том разделе, где говорится о Сеченове, там, да, о, 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 теории, о, о, о науке этого периода. И это вторая драматургия, конечно. Да, то есть она отсутствует, и тоже, мне кажется, это любопытно, было бы любопытно. Меня, кстати, слышно, я не оторвался от жизни. И есть для меня, вот последнее, есть лакуны такого уже методологического, эпистемологического характера. 
чрезвычайно интересные подходы социологического, экономического да, характера, месяц там, чего мне не хватает, ну вот, скажем, опять по какой-то причине, скажем, отброшен такой инструмент как идеология. Вот как такое понимание, да, как способ, вот, соответственно, социология знания, да, вот, в общем, мне кажется, вот это конструирование, социальное конструирование реальности, да, и идеология как инструмент, я, я думаю, что во многих работах это как бы есть, да, но не учитывается, вот, в чем, мне кажется, почему жалко немножко идеологию отбросить, да, потому что тем самым мы теряем эту разделенность все-таки поля, да, вот разделение. Немножко получается из этого сборника, что вот это была позитивистская эпоха, да, что это эпоха, там, ну, понятно, естественно, наук, там, да, рационализма, все, не будем перечислять, вот, и как раз мне кажется, что это все-таки, вот, если вести это понятие идеологию, да, и увидеть дискурс вот такой, как разделенный, да, как, вот, как состоящий, как порождаемый все-таки противоборствующими сторонами, да? вот, ис, исходящий из разных, в некотором смысле даже из образа реальности разный. Да, Достоевский, Чернышевский или там Толстой и Михайловский, да, и это все-таки не, не, да, жители одной эпохи, эпохи реализма, да, как вот хорошо Ирина Аронна Патверна выразил, человек эпохи реализма, да, но, но это и, и, и разные люди, да, и в некотором смысле разные реальности, я бы так сказал, вот реальные, разные реальности, вот этого еще раз, ну, может быть, это мой, на мой субъективный взгляд. Ну, и, и мне, конечно, немножко удивило, вот, что всего одна статья вводит вот такой психоаналитический лакановский подход, да, вот это понимание реального, да, это, это статья... Эмма Либер, Эмма Либер вот, которая очень, ну, не хотел никого выделять, но как-то мне она очень понравилась. Вот. И вот я удивлен, что вот такой подход, ну, как бы оттеснен, да, несколько. Вот, вот это понимание реального, да, как элемента психического аппарата, да, человека, как вот... Хорошо, что такая все-таки там статья есть, но вот, на, на мой субъективный взгляд, я бы тоже это не, не, не выбрасывал, да, не сбрасывал бы, да, экономика, социальное воображение, это замечательно и важно, да, но вот эти, этот инструментарий я бы, конечно, тоже, вот, может быть, активнее бы, активнее бы использовал, на мой субъективный взгляд. На мой субъективный взгляд. Ну, а вообще, завершая, да, я, конечно, еще хотел бы поблагодарить вот, и авторов, и э, составителей, редакторов за действительно это так, такое, в общем, событие, без всяких, я говорю, это без привлечения, это настоящее событие вот, в на, научной жизни, в русистике. Спасибо, спасибо. Спасибо большое, Михаил. Я так думаю, что на языки. I, I'm, I'm thinking uh, we, will, we will move on to Hilda and then maybe address all the questions at once, observations. So I hope everyone can hear me. I want to thank Margarita for including me in this exciting discussion about realism. I've been hearing about the progress of this volume since I first met Margarita over a year ago. Uh, in 2019, she invited me to give a talk about realism for the Basies Conference at San Andrews, and it was a handsome invitation, but I felt I had to explain that although my work began by thinking about realism, I work primarily on sentimentalism. Uh, the title of my long forthcoming book is Noble Sentiments and the Rise of Russian Novels. But Margarita and I worked it out so that I spoke about both realism and sentimentalism. And I think Margarita invited me today for the same reason. So this rich volume of 18 essays is an ambitious attempt to rebrand the study of realism in Russia. Uh, so 
uh, are contrib the editors have explained the stigmas of socialist realism and dogmatic uh, Marxist criticism that made realism an unappealing subject for young Russian scholars who've been eager to absorb the latest Western critical trends. And so fortunately, uh, they've circled back uh, to the with these new approaches to examine realism in Russia with fresh theoretical eyes. And it's not surprising that they emphasize interdisciplinarity and transnationalism. Uh, and the discipline We've uh, heard about the disciplines that have most interested them, and especially uh, society and economics. And the, uh, they include a historiography uh, of uh, the Russian literature, the most interesting Russian literature on realism, especially the work of Lydia Ginsburg. A Western historiography of realism might have shown that realism looms much larger in Russian's literary imagination than it does elsewhere. Uh, scholars in Western literatures have moved past the ascendance of realism posited by Marxists such as Lukash and others. Uh, for example, in his beautifully written 1957 classic study, The Rise of the Novel, studies in Defoe, Richardson, and Fielding, Ian Watt claimed that realist novels were responsible for the rise of novels because the growing middle classes wanted to read about their lives in novels. Watt dismissed the large market for sentimental novels by women writers who led English, England's market as literary degradation that pandered to readers. But scholars today critique Watt for his wishful thinking. Uh, sentimental and not realist novels were the largest share of markets and were respected by contemporary taste markets in their century long reign from the 1750s through the 1850s. Uh, my work on literary markets in Europe and Russia show markets were remarkably well integrated and that foreign literature completely dominated the Russian market through the 1850s. The Russians mark, Russia's market was not an exception. Only France and England exported more than they imported. The German market was equally divided. And the rest of the uh, Europe imported more than they produced. Uh, but Russian's market is exceptional in that they imported much more than other nations, even 90% of literature. Uh, so according to my research, uh, the Russian literature we, we know and love was maybe 10% of the market through the 1850s. Uh, and of this international market, Franco Moretti writes, it's a regular monotonous pattern, all of Europe reading the same books with the same enthusiasm and in the same years when not months, all of Europe unified by a desire not for realism, the mediocre fortunes of Stendhal and Balzac leave no doubts on this point, not for realism, but for what Peter Brooks has called the melodramatic imagination, a rhetoric of stark contrasts that is present a bit everywhere and is perfected by Dumas and Sue and Verdi, who are the most popular writers of the age. The American bestseller in this period was Uncle Tom's Cabin, which replaced America's first bestseller, Susanna Rousen's Charlotta Temple from the late 18th century, which had had 200 editions. Uh, so sentimental and sentimental hybrid novels, many by women, dominated this international market. So Margarita asks, uh, as the volume asks, uh, about women's role uh, in Russian realism uh, has not been sufficiently acknowledged uh, and that this volume uh, doesn't either. So the cover pictures are, are, a, bit of a, 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 are a bit curious to me. Um, Nadezhda Khvashenskaya uh, was the leading women, uh, woman's uh, novelist in the second half of the 19th century with over a dozen novels. And she was the highest paid writer after Turgenev and Tolstoy by the elite journals. Uh, this tells us what her readership was like. So the restoration of women writers to 19th century literary history reveals that sentimental ideals prevailed over realism in a battle of ideas across 19th century Europe. And the most famous sentimentalist of all was George Sand, whose dozens of novels and plays were bestsellers for 50 years, especially in Russia, according to my market data. So this big picture indicates that in the 19th century, most readers in Europe and Russia did not think they were reading realist novels and did not want to be seen as reading realist novels. Flaubert was put on trial because Madame Bovary, a very cruel book, was a realist novel. And we see this bigger picture when Anyankov coined the term pseudo-realism to mean a soulless aesthetic with meaningless descriptions and characters who are either insignificant or wild. Readers wanted a balanced approach that I and others call sentimental realism. 
And we see this bigger picture in debates over Sand and Zola and their idealism and realism, especially in the outpouring of articles upon Sand's death in 1876. This burning debate belied Dostoevsky's and Zola's claims in their eulogies for Sand that she had outlived her relevance. In the European Messenger, Zola claimed that Sand's life, Sand's dream of life as it should be, had been defeated by Balzac and naturalism. Well, not according to the markets. Uh, in diaries and letters, Tolstoy and his wife commented on the novels they were reading and debates over realism and idealism, especially in the French, uh, uh, the French newspaper Revue, Revue des Deux Mondes. Uh, this widely read newspaper in Russia published Sand's work in serialized form, and in 1875 it attacked Zola and the realists. Uh, once Zola attacked Sand, Mikhailovsky and the radical critics attacked Zola's political credentials, leading to his fall from favor at the European Messenger. Uh, like Zola, literary historians claim that realism was ascendant, but judging by criticism everywhere at the time, ideals and moral dramas continued to reign. Uh, and I, I think the true, the true transnational appeal of Russian literature has always lain in its sentiments, especially for the Marxist, including Lukash. It allowed Marxists to overlook that Russian literature was the literature of Russian noble culture. Uh, when Russian novels were first translated, Europeans demonstrated their refinement by discerning uh, all the um, uh, by discerning the humaneness in exotic, barbaric. Uh, Russia's other. Uh, so here is my brief historiography of sentimental realism. Uh, in the 1880s, in a series of articles that would become the widely translated Le Roman Russe, uh, Vicomte Eugène Melchior de Vilguay created the Russian brand when he anointed Turgenev, Dostoevsky, and Tolstoy as caring humanists. He compared them to his favorite writer, George Eliot, whose realism, ironically, he traced to the great sentimentalist Samuel Richardson. He denounced Flaubert and Zola as heartless French realists. Uh, pitting Russian against French literature. And in the year of Sand's death, Turgenev waded into this political debate in his last novel, Virgin Soil, describing his hero as an idealist of realism. Uh, in 18, 1925, in her essay, The Russian Point of View, Virginia Woolf imagines that in a world bursting with misery, the chief call upon us is to understand our fellow sufferers, not with the mind, for it is easy with the mind, but with the heart. And this is the cloud which broods over the whole of Russian literature. A year later, in 1926, Prince Dmitry sviatopolk mirsky marketing Russian literature in England while in exile, explains what he terms sentimental realism. In his history of, the Rus of Russian literature, he declares that Gogol and George Sand were the father and mother of Russian realism. He elaborates Sand's philanthropic sentimentality, a sympathetic, sympathetic attitude to human beings without distinction became the formula of all Russian novelists. Like Wolf and her peers, he brands Russian novels as humane, their equal level human treatment of all humanity was what Europe accepted as their message to mankind when they were first revealed to the West. In the 1960s, Michal Bakhtin made notes for a book on the problem of sentimental realism, which almost merges with the stream of realism, Dickens, Flaubert, the natural school, Dostoevsky, and he proposed to trace the elements of sentimentalism to the present to Bertolt Brecht. And it would have been a synthesis of European and Russian literatures and critical disciplines along the lines of Lydia Ginsburg's work on realism. And so uh, let me conclude. Uh, the challenge for this impressive group of scholars in this volume seems to me to, on the one hand, decrease the importance of realism in Russian literary historiography and reinvigorate discussions of realism in the Western literary traditions. Um, and for a possible future English edition, let me close by suggesting that they coin the term realism in English to suggest what is Russian about the study of realism. Great, thank you so much, uh, Hilda. And uh, <clears throat> I think now um, we, we, some of us may have um, reactions or responses to, to the, um, the comments. Um, Alexei, Kirill, Margarita, um, would anyone like to jump in? 
you can just call on us in alphabetical order and whichever other <laughs> order you want. <laughs> okay, it, 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 it depends on which alphabet, English or, or, or Russian. If it's Russian, then it's you, Rita. Okay, I'm happy to start. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Lydia. And thank you for both of our discussions. That has been absolutely amazing. I've been taking copious notes. Um, and thank you so much for reading the volume so carefully and thinking about it, which it seems at least as much bigger as, as we have thought about it, if not more, to be honest. <laughs> um, I'm going to just very briefly say what I think would be my replies to both um, to both critiques and I absolutely agree with most points that have been made um, I'd like to pick up so I can't actually debate with them but I'd like to pick up on one of the points uh, that was first mentioned and that's about not including Pushkin and um, and Gogol and I think this is where kind of Hilda came in and answered that question for us <laughs> because um, one of the one of the things that we have lamented was something that I've mentioned that the volume hasn't really um, explored uh, non-canonical realisms and these are the realisms that are not in the novel and these are the realisms that kind of fall roughly before the 1940s uh, sorry 1840s but one thing that that made me think about and particularly in the context of the kind of discussions that 19b has been having as a group is that of course like we said in the in the introduction that volume presents um serious sobrimiando in nauke right so it's a representative selection of contemporary scholarships and that actually tells us that there is research that is going on on these topics and we i hope we've mentioned most people that we know of who work on these things in the in the introduction and in the various footnotes that we have but there is still a very big disproportionate number of people who work on canonical subjects and there are structural um, and systemic and professional reasons for that including the accessibility of various materials so one of the things that we hoped the volume would spark precisely by having this lacunas is hopefully an understanding that it is totally legitimate to study non-canonical 19th century writers because these are the biggest gaps we have at the moment um, and one of the things that i wanted to mention um, is also the um, the kind of thing that um I think both um, of our discussants addressed, and that is that the subject of Russian journalism can get really emotional. <laughs> and I think it was particularly um, particularly good when um, our first discussant mentioned that he, as a representative of an old generation, can complain about the troubles he had to have with the um, with Russian realism. But I can say I think one of the one of the geographical vignettes, one of the first times when Alexei and I met was when we both were graduate students and there to give a paper on uh, realism at the Tolstoy conference. The amount of abuse <laughs> that we have received for daring to mention the word the word realism was absolutely unspeakable. And we're obviously, you know, on friendly on friendly terms with with all of the people that we've discussed our work um, in the in the last <laughs> decade. But one of the things that I really hope that volume accomplishes in the Russian speaking um, um, academia and kind of on all levels, right? Not just in Moscow and St. Petersburg, but in um, other universities across the country that study realism, that it actually just legitimizes the word. And perhaps like Hilda suggests, we should be spelling it realism, right? With a with a Z. <laughs> but um, my hope is that we kind of clear the path for the future generation of scholars, not just um, not just kind of globally, but also specifically in Russia, who would not be scared to have realism as a subject for a, uh, you know, kursavaya, referat, and and then later on diplomne and dissertatia, and they will do it properly, hopefully. <laughs> without just reading Bukowski, who I think we perhaps should have mentioned, but um, they, they seem to be reading him all right without our help, <laughs> if that, that makes any sense. So that's my response. Thank you very much to both of our discussants. Uh, this has been wonderful to have your critiques today. Thank you, Rita. Uh, Alexei, is, uh, um, you are next uh, alphabetically. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you both our discussants, Hilda and Mikhail, for their very productive and reasonable uh, suggestions. И если позволите, я, может быть, тоже по-русски, чтобы, так сказать, поддержать заданную тенденцию. У меня, пожалуй, только одно соображение возникло как в качестве ответа на замечательные соображения коллег. Значит, 
Это мое соображение касается очень интересных, очень интересной генеалогии и ландшафта, который Хильда нам предложила и обрисовала. Дело в том, что действительно наш сборник, наш сборник, он, как Маргарита уже сказала, он, конечно же, не дает исчерпывающего панорамного взгляда на реализмы во множественном числе. Да? Не на, и тот ландшафт, который, тот ландшафт реализмов, который существовал с 1830-х по 1880-е и 90-е годы, в идеале, конечно же, должен изучаться и в соотношении того, о чем говорил Михаил Макей, с одной стороны, а с другой стороны в соотношении с реальным литературным рынком и э, историей чтения, и социологией чтения. А, вот э, у нас сегодня, в, как я видел в списке участников, присутствуют э, Рафаэла Васена и Дамиана Ребекини, которые от, э, издали трехтомную только что историю, э, историю чтения в России по-английски. По да, вот там есть э, главы э, Дамиана Ребекини про э, рецепцию чтения романов в России в эпоху реализма. Ну, там, может быть, чуть раньше заканчивается глава у Дамиана, но э, вот такого типа исследования они показывают, что, конечно же, есть э, зазор, гэп да, между э, реальными практиками чтения. Да, вот как Хильда сказала, большинство читателей не знали, что они читают ре, ре, реалистические тексты. И тем, что мы сейчас называем реализмом, и, конечно же, в этом смысле наш сборник – это только ну, вот такой маленький шаг в сторону именно вот этого большого, более комплексного понимания того, как, как встречались читательские реакции да, того времени с одной стороны, а с другой стороны писательская идеология. Спасибо. I am alphabetically next. I I I I I don't have uh, a lot to uh, to add to what has already been said. I I would like to kind of echo uh, Hilda's point that um, you know it's quite it's quite striking that. Um, when we look at the kind of uh, battle between sentimentalist and uh, realist literature that Margaret Cohen describes in her uh, wonderful sentimental education of the novel, um, we simply don't find that in Russia, uh, we find a kind of much more symbiotic sort of relationship between the two. Um, and, and I think that uh, in order for us to understand Uh, realism and its specificity and its realism could, right? We 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 do need to uh, to take into account um, uh, this the importance of uh, the sentimentalist strain within it. So I am in complete agreement and and echo this. The the one place where I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure. You know, it's of course a matter of perception. I am, you know, I am. I I would say that. Uh, uh, the term realism and thought about realism in Western scholarship uh, is very much alive um, and, uh, and is sort of doing things and is provoking uh, theoretical thought. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, yeah, and so uh, I think it's, I think it would be not only, you know, I would hesitate to, to, to imagine Or I would, it would be sad to imagine this volume uh, uh, as a contribution merely to uh, the Russian um, the Russian situation. Uh, I do think that at least uh, uh, at least uh, there's a possibility that thinking about Russian realism would have something interesting to say to people who don't think about Russian realism and who think that they're thinking about realism as such without taking into consideration. Um, other traditions, but that of course kind of flows into the project of uh, worlding realism, which um, uh, which is still ahead in a way for us Slavists. Um, uh, 
I muted myself before I called on Kirill. Kirill, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you uh, to the discussion for the great comments. And for me, the common denominator between Hilda's remarks and Mikhail's remarks was the question of boundaries, right? Boundaries of realism. And this is, I think, great and central because obviously that's the most challenging part, but also the most uh, interesting one because the, the boundary is a place where a phenomenon emerges and can be defined, but also uh, 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 stops existing, right? And obviously the one boundary that we already addressed uh, is the boundary between sentimentalism and realism. And, uh, and uh, that's what, what, what was central for Hilde. And then going uh, to, to Mikhail's remarks, uh, it's, uh, it was about the chronological boundaries, the 1830s. I'm not that competent to speak about Chekhov, but the 1830s and 1840s and the boundaries to poetry. And I think this is, this is indeed a crucial uh, direction to go as we move on, because uh, of course uh, the 1830s, the 1840s is a time where uh, kind of even before the major realist works uh, appear, we already have the, the, the theoretical debate, right? And Mikhail was right to mention Kirillsky's uh, notion, Belinsky's notion of poesy distinctiveness, the poetry of reality, right? Which emerges from the context of, of uh, German idealism. So we have a theoretical language which informs the thinking when, even before the works start appearing. So uh, obviously the emphasis on the markets and on uh, actual leaders is very central. Another central emphasis for me, the takeaway from it would be is that uh, uh, a emphasis must be made on studying and understanding the theoretical languages in which uh, 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 those uh, this thinking was was being articulated, and the the, the whole uh, another point that Mikhail mentioned, the kind of the lyric, the poetry, is of course uh, another case of the same in the sense that uh, in order to articulate the relationship between real uh, lyric and realism, the way would be to analyze the language, the critical language of the theoretical languages that the contemporaries use to understand the phenomenon of lyric and this relationship to, to various other prose, prose modes. And I, I think this is a very productive uh, way forward. So thank you. Thank you, Kirill. And, 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 and now I think we could just uh, open it up for general discussion, right? And uh, I think ideally, if you have a question or comment, uh, just uh, mention that in the chat and then either Sasha or I will call on you. Danny so, Flaherty, go ahead. Hi, thank you everyone for a fascinating discussion and volume. Um, just quickly, I wanted to raise um, just a, as a point of discussion and something I'm interested in is um, the the section divisions um, as as sort of major ways of studying realism. So, um, social imaginary, economic imaginary, epistemology, and um, I, I'm really curious about thinking these together um, and how they all interlink, and the ways that they interlink. And I find that really productive, um, even just in, in, in sort of a, an initial thinking about um, those images. Um, and, and when I find myself trying to think about what realism is, um, which is a question that came up in the chat, you know, I, I find myself sort of within the epistemological, so that it is a kind of a conceptual commitment um, to the idea that there is a fact of the matter, right? This is a kind of realist epistemology. But then I find myself, well, that, that has certain social political commitments, that has social, certain um, you know, economic resonances. Um, and, and, and then, you know, and, and speaking to what some of the discussants were bringing up is the sort of boundary lines between, you know, I think um, Hilda was calling it uh, the sentimental and in my mind, I was thinking the idealist, um, it, both in that epistemological sense and in the ways that it has resonances with, you know, social political commitments. Um, so, so, so that was really sort of interesting to me um, in, in, in trying to make those connections between the spheres to kind of come up with some kind of um, overarching um, definition of both a conceptual commitment, a representational paradigm, and the way these two things are, are inter interlinked. Um, so, so and, and then just a kind of a smaller question within that, um, 
to uh, Mihailo's, Mihailo's point about um, poetry um, is something that came up, you know, for, for me as well. And, and I'm thinking about the ways that, you know, more than just a question of, um, of, of what to include and what to exclude, that it really, you know, as, as, um, as he had mentioned, you know, gets, you know, has some cer certain theoretical implications. Um, and, um, you know, and I'm thinking too about how, you know, this is a kind of a nice or, or could be a nice intervention um, against a, a model of prosaics, right? That, that realism is not a kind of political commitment that, that is implied in, in something like prosaics. Um, and what does that mean then to include a kind of lyrical that might also be a kind of idealist kind of a realism? Um, and, you know, and just, and, and how that, how what we include really does then have resonance um, across these different um, approaches. Um, so, uh, so thank you very much. I feel like it would uh, probably be counterproductive for us to go around and, and respond to each, uh, to each of the comments. So uh, maybe we could just, uh, uh, take the initiative if you feel uh, called, uh, uh, if you feel <laughs> called uh, upon to, to, to respond, then you can. Kirill, Rita, and Alexei, is that uh, work? Okay. I feel this is one of those for you, Ilya. For me? Yeah. Um, I, I'm happy to take it if you, if you, if you want to. I think you, you know, you're muted. So I don't know if you do want me to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I think it's, well, first it's lovely to meet you for a face, face to a, to a name. Um, um, we've been kind of, uh, Alexei and I have both been keeping an eye on what's been happening <laughs> in the thoughts on the, on the 1860s. And I think what you're talking about is very similar to uh, the work by Sarah Lawrence, who I'm sure you know. Uh, I think one of the things one of the things that Sarah has suggested um, in in her thesis, which I think she's unfortunately not uh, going to rework as a book, but some of you might have heard um, about Sarah, and we're discussing her um, her suggestion in our book, is that um, Sarah was talking that we perhaps underestimate the connection between German idealism and Russian idealism in a sense um, as its philosophy applies to the aesthetics of Russian. Uh, realism. And I feel that in many ways that kind of perhaps um, answers one of your questions. This is certainly how I have resolved for myself <laughs> the kind of thing that the, the kind of uh, controversy that you're talking about. So I just thought, hmm, I think Sarah is making a very good point there. Um, I think we can, uh, we're going to go with that. Um, and I think it's really interesting um, when we think about how that is actually mapped onto the narrative structures themselves because the kind of philosophical connections with idealism that um, are very, very obvious in theoretical writings by people like Chernyshevsky, for example, whom I think Ilya has already mentioned as potentially the evil one of, of kind of everything that's happening in discussions of Russian realism, is very obvious. And, you know, even the Soviet scholars were talking about it all the time. However, for the kind of reasons that Hilda talks about um, um, in her book and in, in her presentation today, we're actually not that inclined to talk about idealism in narrative fiction because it becomes mired with sentimentalism and utopianism, all of these genres that realism doesn't really like and looks at uh, very patronizingly. Uh, so I think there is definitely a lot to be said for thinking about how these modes of inquiry that we're fairly comfortable with in the theory of Russian realism actually map on onto the narrative structures. And this is certainly that I think people should be doing more. <laughs> um, absolutely, so thank you for that question. Thank you. I think Shama Shahadat, did you? Um... Did you have yes. Yeah, please. Yeah, I have a question. <laughs> Thank you also for me. Uh, this was so interesting and I will order the book at once for our library and for myself. Um, I have a question um, about translation because um, Margarita was talking about global realism and Hilde was talking about that people all over Europe were reading the books. Have you thought about translations? Um, in which language they re who read what and what happened? Because, for example, Walter Koschmal, a German um, Slavist, he argues that it was so easy for Dostoevsky to enter uh, the, the circulation of world literature because 
it was his ideas they that were translated and not not the language didn't play any part so because it was uh, a realist, a realist um, thinker thought about the same things as Dostoevsky's and the readers thought about it. So, so it was easy to enter a global circulation in opposite to other texts, which never made it. Pushkin is much, had a much harder time to be translated and understood by the readers who were not Russian, since um, the language played a bigger role. Or uh, for example, Freud, he read uh, Dostoevsky's Zapisky's Patpolia in French. And from there on, he developed his own ideas about La Zeka, who, which he took from, about the Hintertür, which he took from, from uh, Dostoevsky, but he, he read not in, not in Russian, of course, and not even in German, but in French. So things happen on this on this way from one translation from from the original to the translation to the reader, and I think this is also worth uh, thinking about. I don't know. Did you did you tackle that? Please, Kirill. Yes, really thank you, just... uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Shama, for the great question and. Uh, uh, of course, all of us are thinking about this constantly, right? Even as we are writing uh, uh, or in, in English about Russian literature or translating as we did, we did a lot of translating from English to, into Russian for this volume, right? So this is a thing that we live in. And I, I, I don't think I have a, a response to those questions, but I think that that uh, here we have the, the very uh, fundamental uh, conundrum, right? There are two different ways of looking at Russia versus the West here. And one emphasizes identity and singularity. And obviously we need that because this is what we do, right? Russian literature is our object of study. And of course we don't want to amalgamate, kind of assimilate it into kind of, and just look at, look at it as, a, as, as, uh, uh, as, as, as irrelevant. On the other hand, uh, 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 there is a way of looking at everything that happens in Russian and everything that happens in Russia as, as part of the global processing, right? Bilinsky writes in a review of Eugène Sue's Parisian, uh, uh, the Mystère de Paris, and then this review gets translated into German and is read by Marx. So there is a whole kind of a way of looking at all of it as, as being an interconnected space, right? And uh, it is a, I guess it is one of the questions that we as a community face, right, as a community of scholars is to tackle this question, to approach this question and to look, to acknowledge that we have those two different uh, perspectives and we sort of needs them both, we need them both simultaneously. Thank you, <laughs> great answer. <laughs> Um, I would like to read uh, Jillian's, uh, unless Jillian, you would like, um, well, you wrote it down, so presumably, uh, okay, I will, I will read Jillian's uh, comment um, following up on Hilda. Um, I took Hilda to be suggesting, at least in part, that as long as we keep talking about Russian realism, we are likely to keep failing to recognize women authors' crucial involvement in 19th century literature. But if we started talking sentimental realism, we could obtain a considerably richer understanding of the works by both women and men in the period. I'd be curious to know what others think about how many of the essays in the present volume could have just as easily fit into a volume on sentimental realism. So I, I wanted to, in listening to the discussion, uh, I wanted to explain what I mean by sentimentalism because my my long forthcoming book, Noble Sentiments, is really a recasting of sentimentalism. And so that might be helpful in thinking about uh, uh, Jillian, uh, your question. So I, I take sentimentalism not as being the unrestrained uh, uh, outpouring of feelings as somehow an indication of one's true nature, uh, but as part of uh, the 18th century uh, education project. Uh, the questions that the 18th century philosophers and, and novelists were raising were a, a very broad range of questions about how is it that we can control our worst impulses? How do we, how do we control our emotions? And uh, duty is important. And uh, the idea of society, Adam Smith and our conscience, the inhabitant of the breast, uh, everything points to an education project. And so uh, I think 
this is when we look at Dostoevsky, for example, what he did when he returned from exile in The Insulted and the Humiliated, he is writing an education novel of sorts. And so this maps on really well to what the Russians were interested in. How do you, how do you educate and how do you change people? How do you change people? And so that's a different way of thinking about sentimentalism that I think makes it more congenial to most people because as much as realism has uh, suffered uh, a, a, a loss of reputation, sentimentalism is really at the top of the list for having uh, suffered a loss of reputation. If I could jump in um, with a response to that, I think I would just say that I, um, I, I was struck in hearing from the editors that uh, despite their best intentions to try to get more essays on women, you know, the, the essays just did not come. And so in hearing your comments, Hilda, I was just imagining possibly for future collections for future editors interested in getting a fuller picture, maybe if they used the, uh, the term sentimental realism with this um, understanding of sentimentalism that you have in mind, there could still be plenty of work on a lot of the same male authors who are maybe not um, even if they're not as invested in the specific term sentimental realism themselves, they could be submitting work to that volume and other people could also be submitting work to that volume um, that that is dealing with work by women. And it might be the case that there's a branding issue there that could be addressed. Um, so that was just, I mean, I was just very struck by this idea that maybe if we use the different term, then we'll get, we'll see more work uh, coming out on women writers. And of course, it will open up a better understanding of the male authors as well. So I appreciated that intervention very much. Thank so, you. Yes. We have a question. Shall I move on to the next question? Okay. Um, from, from Emily Wong. Uh, Emily, would you like to read? Uh, ask a question aloud, or should I read the question for you? Oh, I can read it. Um, right. So I kind of wrote a long question. Apologies for that. Um, so since there was discussion in the chat about what realism is, and this is related to our broader topic, to what extent does presumed audience change the way that we think about what realism is? This is related to the question that Hilda Hugenboom brought up about women readers and writers, right? If we're thinking about um, primarily male readers. That's that's we 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 come up with a different question than if we think more holistically. But it's also relevant to the question about periodization, right? Uh, that um, uh, Mikhail Mikheyev brought up. Uh, to what ex what did readers from the 1830s or the 1930s perceive as real? Right? Socialist realism is this something that was actually perceived by readers as realistic? Because um, it's also idealistic. Also, in some ways, can be seen as as sentimental in the way that. Uh, Hilda just defined sentimentalism. And then also a question that's relevant to all of us, especially when we think about questions about uh, canon, which is the audience of students whose interests partially determine what we end up teaching and what therefore becomes canonical. So um, when we were talking about what realism is, are we thinking about, I mean, this was, this was a volume that was targeted towards uh, a broad audience of Russian reading readers, but um, does the picture of what realism change of what realism has changed when we think about um, audiences from a different period or audiences from a different place. Thank you. I'm not sure that this would this would make up a, a, a satisfying response, but I, I guess um, you know, and, and I'm not also sure if my co-editors would would agree. Um, but um, my sense is that uh, you know there there may we we may we, it's easy with realism to get confused <laughs> about uh, um, uh, a, a literary his, uh, between literary historical um, right. uh, meaning of the term and on the one hand and epistemological uh, one right mm -hmm. so so I think I I think um, 
the question of how um, of, of what readers think uh, and authors think is realistic mm -hmm. falls into the it seems to me the the kind of epistemological right uh, and the two of course are not uh, distinguishable uh, and that's of course the point of of, uh, of of these people calling themselves realists mm -hmm. um, all right but at the same time uh, I do think that on some level our project uh, may have been better titled <laughs> if mm -hmm. it said something like well and in here I don't know I may get in trouble with my co-editors but uh, if it indicated a little bit more that we're talking about literature in the age of realism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? that makes sense. So, 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 uh, so that would then take us, I think, beyond, um, potentially beyond uh, having to police borders. Right. Uh, well, uh, in, in connection with sentimentalism, especially because, um, you know, I, I think that in the Russian context, it really does not work to think of women authors of the period as sentimentalist or sentimentalist and male as realist. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't. I mean, I, I haven't read anything more realist in my whole life than Kvashinska Pierve Barba. I mean, that text is could could fit right into right next to Flaubert, right? As a mm -hmm as a non-idealist kind of profoundly, well, I, again, you know, this is debatable, but uh, vice versa, Turgenev as a, as a, you know, profoundly sentimental uh, author mm -hmm. uh, in, in ways that are, I think, quite regular. So I, you know, so I, I, you know, I'm not sure what I'm saying here quite because, um, because I, I guess, um, and, and I'm still, I think, on board with the idea of somebody doing a sentimentalist realism project um, but but I do wonder if we also if if in attempting to uh, uh, produce these uh, hybrid concepts we are rarefying the initial right. concepts right? right and sort of stopping no longer asking ourselves uh, what realism uh, what realism ultimately uh, could embrace mm -hmm. to begin with um, uh, for these people so. Um, and um, yeah, and I think uh, in, it, it could embrace different things in different national historical contexts and national historical contexts. Certainly, mm -hmm. I think Russian realism is unthinkable about sentimentalism, without Thank sentimentalism. You. Thank you. And we have a question from Ilya Vinitsky. Ilya, if you go ahead and unmute uh, yeah. yourself. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Ilya Vinitsky. Uh, so here's the question. First of all, I want to thank uh, the uh, editors and contributors uh, for the wonderful volume. We'll test uh, it as soon as we'll start in, as in, uh, in my class, Graduate Seminar on Realism uh, this Wednesday. Uh, we will read the summaries to read the uh, uh, introduction um, and to formulate questions. So probably I will contact you if you're interested in and if you are generous enough to respond to these um, uh, questions. Uh, secondly, I really like the background of Ilya Klieger's um, Zoom uh, window with the overcoat uh, on the back as if we all came out uh, uh, from Chignel uh, uh, Gogolia in realistic um, uh, sense uh, of it. And uh, I do have a question. So if the term doesn't work, so we can certainly change the term, uh, but by changing the term, uh, should we use other terms like sentimental or uh, romantic, or we should make up some kind of absolutely uh, different uh, uh, term to define this uh, uh, phantom um, uh, to uh, defamorize it as a crazy suggestion instead of realism to use the term observism. Uh, uh, derived from observe, uh, which would center not on the goal, but on the method, on distancing yourself uh, from the object which you observe and playing with all implications uh, of the uh, term observe and uh, observation uh, taken from uh, the dictionary. This is just a crazy um, uh, uh, suggestion. The second suggestion perhaps is more uh, serious. Uh, if we say sentimental, romantic, um, uh, sentimental realism or romantic realism, all these terms were used. Actually, we can use neoclassical realism and can find some uh, text which would uh, respond to this um, uh, definition uh, as well. It's kind of mechanic approach 
uh, because what we have here and what actually I try to show in my book on um, uh, realism uh, and spiritualism is that realism is basically kind of um, um, repression of romanticism and sentimentalism, but they fight back. So what we deal with uh, is a tension is a kind of internal dialogue, an attempt uh, to uh, submerge certain uh, ideas, uh, forces, uh, narrative uh, methods, which are not accepted as modern nowadays, but which still are present by virtue, because if we deny something, it exists in our denial, like the, uh, of denial, and it's, uh, they can strike uh, back. And it provides us with the possibility uh, to define uh, this cultural um, period major uh, trend uh, as a conflict, as a conflict between various um, uh, previous trends, uh, uh, which are contemporaneous uh, by virtue because they are present uh, in the internal dialogue of this uh, governing trend uh, uh, in attempt to uh, establish itself by means of uh, denial or revision of uh, the precedents. And here there is a room uh, for sentimentalism, uh, for romanticism, uh, for Baroque, uh, for uh, anything, uh, depending on the author, uh, authors, uh, group um, uh, presented uh, in the age of realism. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ilya. I think this is um, kind of hitting the nail on the head. and. I'm kind of representing the contextual approach today and I wanted to give an answer or at least a comment to what you just said from the kind of contextual point of view. Um, I, some of you might know, but um, the kind of slides that I've showed in the beginning of today's presentation actually formed the part of my and Katya Bowers, who is also there on the Zoom. Hi Katya. A proposal that we've submitted to a um, couple of publishers when we were um, trying to sell kind of an equivalent of that volume that we have we're presenting here today in English, right? Um, and the interesting thing is that despite the fact that the market gap is very obvious, we were told by um, CUP that they won't publish it because they just think they're publishing other things about Russian literature which are much more interesting to the general audience. Um, and then we kind of reformatted and submitted it to Oxford University Press who have signed it up, yay, but it has meanwhile transformed into the handbook of global realisms of which Russian is one. So I think what you were saying just now reflects exactly the kind of intellectual work that is happening in other disciplines that look into realism. Is it a conflicted term? Yes. Why is it conflicted? It's firstly, it is conflicted in the way in which you've described it, but it's also very conflicted if we start looking at it from the kind of contemporary scrutiny of does it actually represent various bits of Russian society that contemporary historiography starts to represent more and more. And I know that lots of people on this Zoom work on various uh, marginalized groups, right? There is quite a lot of work going on in the representation of peasants, so Jenny and Alexei and Kirill and lots of other people uh, who are also here, there's just too many, too many to name. So the, one of the main things that we can ask about Russian realism and realism as a term is actually um, who does it include and who does it exclude? Um, and I think this is exactly the kind of interrogation that we should um, subject it to. And again, this is why um, I've really liked Hilda's suggestion that perhaps we should start spelling it with a Z <laughs> just to pinpoint the Russian uh, one. But that would also uh, pinpoint kind of the um, difference between the contemporary understanding of realism as we think of it as Russians, as Slavists, and the contemporary realism, contemporary understanding of realism as comparative literature understands it. And we all know that we're quite often slightly out of sync with that discipline, even though it does look at Russian examples. And actually, that's something that we've tried to discuss in the introduction as well, when we talked about Welek and um, the bit where we talk about Auerbach and Mimesis. So comparative literature thinks a lot about Russian realism, but it comes to completely different conclusions to us. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very interesting why, and this is something that I think we should be talking about a little bit more um, and should ask ourselves why. So I think, yeah, absolutely valid point. We should be interrogating it, but we should be interrogating it not just within the Slavic studies, but we should be interrogating it within the wider theoretical um, discussions that are happening in humanities in general. Um, that's, that's my comment to that, but thank you. Kirill, please. Yes, I would. Uh... I know we agreed to only kind of uh, do one response per question, but I think this is central. So I would I would uh, give a, uh, a, 
uh, uh, it's kind of look at it from a different perspective, right? Uh, so uh, one way would be to add the, to substitute the S for the Z in realism. Another thing would be to put quotation marks around realism with an S. Uh, so we speak about realism because it was a concept used by contemporaries, right? Anilkov introduced it in an article of 1848. Dostoevsky wrote about how Anna Karenina is true realism. So it is a central concept for those debates, right? And uh, for me, it, it seems very productive to use it in, in that way as a uh, concept which designates a particular theoretical framework, which was relevant for criticism of that era, for a theoretical criticism of that era. And there it has an epistemological claim, right? That literature reflects reality. But then reality or actuality, действительность, wirklichkeit, is a term in itself. It's, a, it's not automatic empirical uh, reality, but it is also a philosophical term. So the whole debate of, on, on realism becomes uh, uh, steeped in a particular theoretical discussion, which uh, basically is rooted in Hegel, right? And in the Hegelianism. So all of those terms, they kind of have their own, and Hegel doesn't use the term realism, so it's more complicated than that, but they have their particular meanings, right? And for example, in the Hegelian system, uh, Ilya spoke about how uh, realism does not suppress romanticism, and the Hegelian system already includes that or gives has potential for that juxtaposition, how realism and romanticism can be thought of as one. So I, I, would, uh, I would, again, add quotation marks and look at realism as a, a theoretical uh, question that was debated and conceptualized and thought through. And uh, this seems to me uh, a, a, produ a more productive approach than, as Ilya said to, as Ilya Kliger said, to police the borders. Because obviously, if you, in this perspective, if we look at the chantic or sentimental, we can see that there is no mutual exclusion, right? It's, it can be easily said that in different conceptual paradigms available to a contemporary around the year 1850, uh, the same work could be as thought of as really sentimental or romantic, and romantic, and romantic. So all of those things could apply depending on which uh, paradigm you apply. So, uh, and I think we could kind of take our cues from those theoretical paradigms to, uh, to yeah, to, to kind of to see the tension that are at stake. And in that, I agree with Ilya Vinitsky that the tension is the primary uh, uh, object that I think we're after, even though, yes, I was not uh, empowered to talk for all co-editors or con contributors. What is um, Anne Lounsbury had a question, Anne, if you want to go ahead. Sure, it's a very kind of general and basic question, but um, I would be interested to hear from people. And that is, it's a pedagogical question. How do you start talking to students, relatively unsophisticated students, about what realism is? You know, when they walk into your class and um, they have a certain idea of what that term means, um, how do you start to take it apart for them? And I would particularly be interested to hear from uh, Russian colleagues about how you do this in a Russian pedagogical context. Um, if anyone can speak to that. Uh, I'm about to teach War and Peace, and I'm going to start with um, Bogle's quote, which is in English, it's something like, uh, if the world could write itself, it would write like Tolstoy, um, and try to undo that a little bit. So thank you very much for any thoughts. Alexei, that seems targeted. Uh, well, first of all, I, uh, I have now a bad, um, bad connection, but I do my best to follow all the discussion. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, Anne asked about the, how, how uh, our approaches to realism when teaching. Am I right? Okay. Uh, so uh, the problem in, in our teaching, uh, in our current teaching, uh, in my sense, that um, at the, uh, on one hand, we have, uh, we have a lot of classes devoted to the middle of the 19th century, uh, two or three, uh, from, from two to four months, uh, related to uh, Russian literature from the 40s 
to the 80s and even 90s. At the same time, when we uh, begin, begin to, uh, to teach, we immediately face the problem that uh, uh, we try to fill this space with uh, minor writers uh, and uh, in, uh, for the sake of balance. And in this situation, in this case, for example, we can have, uh, I don't know, we can have uh, five classes, uh, five Tolstoy's classes, only five. Uh, then five classes, four classes on Turgenev, then four or five classes to minor writers, but not, of course, in Russian context, not so minor, like uh, Chernyshevsky, um, Goncharov, uh, Ostrovsky, Nikrasov, and so on and so forth, up to Chekhov. And uh, among all these writers, we, all, we uh, sometimes uh, lose uh, the point of realism, I would say, because we have uh, not so many time to, to uh, go in detail when speaking about what realism is. It's my uh, experience because um, I teach only the small part of the 19th century, I mean uh, 50s and 60s, so how our curriculum uh, at uh, high school of economics uh, works. And it is the constant problem, uh, eternal problem for us, how to balance between uh, diversity uh, versus conceptualization. Thank you. Any other questions for anyone? Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, uh, and, sorry, were you, and were you gonna say something? Yeah, I just wanna close by, first of all, thanking everybody again and reminding everyone that a week from today we have another seminar and that it starts at 11.30, which is deviant. Um, so please mark your calendars for deviance. And um, I also just wanted to say thank you again. This was absolutely fantastic. And it, it really, I think that is, is um, it shows what we can do when, when we uh, work across borders and I hope that um, we'll keep it up. It's really important work. Thank you so much.